Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, this morning. Uh, it's nice to see so many of you here. Um, this is the first of our winter series of uh, online learning sessions, uh, which we're calling 10 2030. Um, today, we're looking at uh, online exhibitions. And I'm going to switch you over to uh, a very simple PowerPoint presentation that I've put together that just really summarizes a few of the things that uh, I'm, I'm going to say. Uh, so that is, where is that? That is right there. Today I'm going to give you um, a very short 20 minute presentation um, about online exhibitions, which follows on from the film that I put up uh, earlier in the week. Uh, and then we've got about 30 minutes when we can have uh, a chat about um, the subject and there's one or two questions I want to put to you and uh, an opportunity to share uh, our experiences. Um, so to begin with, these are the sections that I'm going to um, just be flying through this morning. Um, this is very much uh, a beginner's guide. Uh, this is a big subject, uh, as I discovered when I tried to condense it into 20 minutes and discovered that I could have been talking for, for two hours. The idea here is to uh, provide you with a practical introduction to creating exhibi exhibitions online. Um, it doesn't end there. If you want um, some further support to create an exhibition, um, you're very welcome to get in touch with me and, uh, and I can see what kind of one-to-one um, -one support I can, I can offer you. Uh, so today, these are the questions I'm going to work through, uh, and these are the questions that I put into our uh, introductory video um, as a process for working through creating an online exhibition. And my first question is, uh, why, why exhibit online? Uh, which really goes along with um, why exhibit at all? Um, we all know that archives have to continually prove their value and, and, and relevance to the bodies that, uh, that fund them. And that's one of the primary reasons that we, that we create exhibitions, um, so that we can justify our existence and share the material that we've got. They also showcase the records um, that, we're held, that we hold in our archives and demonstrate the relevance of those records to audiences locally. Um, but with online exhibitions, we can do that nationally and internationally as well. Um, we're aiming for um, intellectual interests, but also emotional engagement. Um, we perhaps want to provide samples of what's available in the archive so that people can um, be more aware of what's there and perhaps then become more regular visitors. Um, showcasing particular collections. Um, a good exhibition often starts with your own enthusiasm um, for, for something that you think nobody else has seen. Um, you may also have um, an educational remit. Uh, so an exhibition can fulfill that, um, that remit. There are pros and cons uh, to online exhibitions. Um, they're cheaper. You can reach a much wider and more diverse audience. Um, they can stay up in the public domain for as long as you're prepared to have them up there and, the, and someone's prepared to give them web space. Um, they can facilitate interaction with archives in a different way. Um, people visiting a physical exhibition will tend to visit walk around, look at things, maybe take notes, then maybe come back or take photographs. But uh, with an online exhibition, um, there's none of that travel time, none of the limits of opening and closing. They're open 24 hours a day. Um, and there are tools available that allow collection of user data, um, which is a very good way of demonstrating visitor engagement. On the other hand, um, you need a certain technical expertise, uh, which many archive staff don't feel confident um, about. Um, you can't touch the records. There's been a lot of discussion about this, you know, is it the same seeing something through a glass screen online uh, as um, visiting and seeing the actual document? The reality is a lot of the actual documents are in glass cases and, and quite difficult to focus on. Um, so I think that there's a big advantage in digital exhibitions augmenting the experience of visiting an archive. Um, but you can't touch them. Shorter audience attention span. The online audience is notoriously fickle, and if something uh, isn't loading in 0.2 of a second, uh, then they'll click away and go and do something else and watch 10 minutes of, of YouTube videos or something instead. Um, so you've, you've got to engage with people in a different way online. Um, there are image quality limits. Um, 
and uh, it's harder sometimes to get emotional engagement when you're viewing things on a screen. You also need a different approach to designing, navigating and interpreting material if you're, um, if you're doing something online. Um, and we're going to go into a bit more detail about that. You've got some limits on uh, online e exhibitions, bandwidth, organizational policies are often a problem, firewalls, um, certain types of um, uh, internet tools being blocked um, by uh, council sites or by private um, companies. Uh, so these are, these are some of the limitations. First question to ask yourself if you're doing an online exhibition is what are you trying to accomplish? Um, it, it, it's always good to come up with an idea for this and then um, shrink it by half. Um, it, it's very easy to go over the top in thinking about what you're going to do. And the, the, the key is to keep it simple. Um, uh, Michael Belcher, uh, who is some writer or other who wrote a book about exhibitions in museums in 1991, um, so before the internet, um, he defined an exhibition as showing for a purpose, the purpose being to affect the viewer in some predetermined way. It's important to know what you're trying to do with this particular exhibition that you're, uh, that you're putting on, as well as more generally why you're creating an exhibition. Um, once you define the purpose, you make planning uh, much easier. Um, you identify the audience for the exhibition and the purpose of reaching that audience. Um, it also identifies what you want your archive service to get out of staging the exhibition. It's really good to be clear about those things before you even start um, pulling together records and, and deciding how it's all going to be laid out. Um, some of the answers to these questions can be simple. Uh, it might be that you just want to attract a new audience um, in a particular age group or a particular interest group, a particular demographic or a geographical area. Um, you might be coinciding with a local or national event. Um, a, a theme, an anniversary. Um, you might be wanting to pilot an idea, uh, and online exhibitions are particularly useful for this. Mounting a small online exhibition to see what the what the response is and to see how it how it looks, um, and then moving on to um, a, a larger one. Um, you might just want to engage interest and get feedback, um, or raise awareness of some hidden materials in your uh, in your archive that perhaps you can't show um, uh, because they're too delicate. Uh, or just too unwieldy to, um, to, to put out on public display. Um, identifying your audience is also a good idea. So just some simple questions uh, like, who are they? Why might they be visiting the exhibition? And what do they want from the exhibition? What do you want them to take away? Um, what are the different learning styles that you might uh, encounter amongst people who are visiting the exhibition? How are you going to cater for that? Now, once you've thought about why you're doing the exhibition, um, it's important then to look at what story you're going to tell. Um, an exhibition, it needs an organizing principle. Otherwise, it's just a collection. Uh, a collection online is all very laudable, but it's not an exhibition. Um, so you need a, a theme for your exhibition, which is going to um, limit what you select. And you may already have a theme from the material that you've identified. Um, but you also need a story to engage visitors and to keep it memorable after they leave. We, as, as human beings, we're, we're hardwired for stories and narratives. Um, stories um, are a way to connect the elements of a, a, a themed exhibition together in a way that's emotionally satisfying. Um, the poet uh, Mary Oliver um, said that attention without feeling is only a report. Um, if you want more than just a report, um, a display of stuff, then you need to have a narrative that connects all of those exhibited records together um, and um, engenders some kind of emotional response. Now, a narrative can be simple. It can be um, chronology causation. So, for example, a timeline showing how uh, architectural styles changed with the development of different building materials or in coordination with changing attitudes towards class, for example. That's enough of a narrative to get started. Um, and then you tell that story through your through your materials and through the and the interpretation. More complex, tight narratives, um, uh, the stories of individuals, their experiences, relationships, um, a series of cascading events. Um, whatever whatever the story is that you choose, make sure it fits with the purpose of the exhibition. And then one exercise I, I, I suggest, not just for exhibitions, actually for a lot of project type things, but for exhibitions, it's really useful. Summarize it in a sentence. And if you can, 
um, then it's probably good to go. And if you can't, you need to refine it uh, and clarify what it is that you're um, that you're looking for. Uh, so what records are you going to use? Um, it might be that you've already got the records and that you drew the theme from the records. But if you're thinking of doing a, a theme or a story first, then how do you go about choosing the right um, records? Obviously, it's an online exhibition, so it's got to be digitized. You need dig digitized records or you need photographs of records on display. Um, that is one way of doing an, a, an online exhibition is simply to take a photograph of a physical exhibition and then put it up online. Um, not quite as not quite as blunt as that, but you get the idea. Um, choose a good variety of records, just as you would for a physical exhibition, um, but make sure that they're records that can be digitized effectively if they're not already um, digitized. Um, and then there's a nice long list of adjectives there um, to describe the different um, things that you might be looking for. Um, useful, entertaining, interesting, original, compelling, impactful. Um, use your own judgment about this um, and and we're all quite uh, experienced at, at doing this, I think, in archives um, for online. Um, look for things that are going to have impact um, visually, um, but also are going to have interest when you burrow into them. Um, be aware that uh, online platforms tend to work better with compressed images, because if you put very large images online, they take ages to load and then people get bored and they click away. Um, so uh, compressed images. Um, if you have full size images that you want people to see, um, then you can always um, make them available as downloads um, on a click. Um, JPEG or um, GIF images are better for online use and the most widely used. So presentation. Um, there's lots of online platforms that give a, a, a variety of presentation organizational options. Um, it's important that your exhibition is visually interesting, it's clear and consistently organized, uh, and you need a navigation system that allows an overview and then a pathway through the exhibition. But be aware that online visitors arrive at different points in your exhibition, um, and they don't always follow the rules. Um, they like to click about and see see what's there. Um, and so your um, your exhibition is better if it's got a, a kind of a hierarchy of information, layers to click through, um, an overview, and then you click down to a bit more detail. And then if you really want to know about that record, you click through again and you get more detail. Make sure it's accessible for different uh, learning styles. I'll say a little bit more about that um, in a minute. Um, your exhibition needs to be uh, as simple as possible. Um, consistency of navigation is really important. Um, and like I said before, a, a useful principle is to have a, an overview and then layers of detail, a bit like zooming into Google Earth and then zooming out again. Um, often that's the way that people navigate around online exhibitions is that they go into detail and then they come out to the overview and then they choose the next place that they're going to go. Um, here's a few just best practices for creating um, web-based experiences. Um, 250 to 350 words is about right for, um, for exhibition text. Um, keep paragraphs short, pithy, um, and, and you, know, you better to have a few that you just click through. Um, if you've got video content, then 90 seconds is about the limit that you want for any one video clip. Um, captions and short descriptions are to accompany records. Um, with richer descriptions available when you scroll or when you click through. Um, that way people can um, make a choice about how much detail they want. Um, don't use too many fonts. Um, choose fonts that are easy to read. Um, there are websites which tell you the most um, accessible fonts to be, read, to be read on different devices. Um, and it's particularly um, uh, tablets that you need to be wary of. Um, Build your exhibition in layers so that there are multiple spaces to visit, rooms, if you like, uh, within the exhibition. Um, a simple exhibition um, can have four layers of detail. So your overview that I mentioned before, a storyline that guides 
um, the, the, the willing traveler through the exhibition, but also individual items. So you click and you can see a larger image of, of the individual item, um, along with a short descriptive label, label and transcription, and then click again or scroll um, to go to fuller detail, um, rich information and perhaps links even or downloads. Um, now, there are different platforms um, on which you can you can build your exhibition. Um, the Squarespace, Wix, WordPress are the three that I've highlighted um, here. Squarespace has the disadvantage that you have to pay £140 to use it um, each year, um, but it is um, click and drag, extremely easy to set up and very professional um, in final appearance. Um, Wix is a free version of the same kind of thing, um, but it carries branding um, and it's a little more limited in its, um, in its styles. WordPress is one that a lot of us are, are familiar with. Um, it takes a little bit of technical know-how to, to get used to WordPress, but um, it's very um, accessible uh, once, you, once you know how to use it. Um, now, some of you will have access to web pages within an organizational site. Um, make sure that you build good relations with the IT department. Um, it's pretty hard to do it without them. Um, and also practice articulating very clearly what it is that you want, um, what it is you want in terms of appearance and what it, how you want the content. Uh, there's a piece of software called Omica, um, which is a little like WordPress. In fact, it's a lot like WordPress. Um, it has a .com version and it also has a .org version, so you can host it yourself or you can use the hosted option. Uh, it's, uh, it looks and feels like WordPress, but it's designed for archives. Um, so it has um, collection level um, detail and you can then use Omica to create exhibitions with the material that you've put into your online collections. I'm going to show you the home page of that in a minute. Um, now I want to give you some, um, I just want to show you some brief examples of different um, websites using different tools. Um, when you build a, an exhibition on one of these sites, it's useful to use some software tools um, to manipulate uh, material. Um, so I want to show you, um, uh, the first example I want to show you is the Newbury Library in Chicago. Um, uh, and that's just need to switch you over to that there. So this is called the Midwest Time Machine. And um, they've used a little um, online tool um, which allows you to choose your time traveler. So I'm going to choose uh, Julia Newbery here. I'm going to bring, begin my journey. And what happens is that a map loads up with the different uh, places where the records uh, are, are located. And if I jump through, I can zoom in on the map and you can see on the side here that there's um, information uh, about um, Chicago. Um, and down here, there's a link through to um, more detail about that page. Or I can continue the story, just click through the, um, the exhibition and it zooms in on the next location, uh, which is Brooklyn uh, in New York. Uh, and then we can zoom again and it zips around. Now this is made with a little uh, tool uh, which is created by a company um, called um, something or other, which I'm going to show you in a minute. Um, but let's just jump to the other site I want to show you that also uses a little tool, and that's this one here. Now this is the Auckland City Archives in New Zealand, and this is their exhibition about women's suffrage, and they've organized it as a timeline. So you scroll through the timeline and you decide who you want to find information about, or you can jump to 1950, and you can see that we can expand out and have a look at information about different um, individuals. Uh, so if we want to look at um, Jesse Tom, uh, we can look there, or we can go to Rita Violet Full James. And I think we can see some, oops, sorry, jumped to the wrong one there. I think we can see some detail uh, of our records here, and then you can jump and open the record itself. So in this case, it's a, a newspaper article uh, about this lady. Now, the third site I'm going to look, show you briefly is called Night Lab. Um, now, Night Lab is the company that makes these different tools for storytelling. And one of them is called Juxtapose, um, which is great fun. I'm going to show you one of those in a minute. Juxtapo Juxtapose lays two photos, one on top of the other, and allows you to scroll between them. 
to see. So if you've got photographs of the same place, um, 50 years apart, um, you can then see what they look like. Or if you've got a photo of two people 20 years apart, you can, you can um, switch between them to see uh, the comparison. Um, they do other tools. Um, SoundSight, for example, gives you inline audio so you can have some text and then you just hover your mouse over a piece of it and it reads it to you. Um, uh, and there's a VR tool there as well. But the one I want to show you is um, Juxtapose um, and that is the Berlin Morgan Post. Here we are. And the Berlin Morgan Post has done a series of its archived photographs uh, from 1945 at the end of the war and then the, the photo taken now and you can see that I can just take my mouse and I can scroll backwards and forwards hopefully you're all seeing that um, or I can take here's the Reichstag here uh, nowadays and as it was in 1945 uh, and it's a very simple little tool all they've done is they've loaded all of these photos into this um, this tool and then they've um, told it to embed into the site in the same way that you would embed a YouTube video. So briefly, just to mention Omica, um, this is Omica. Um, this is the omica.org site. Um, it's open source. So unlike um, some of the um, collections, online collection software, which is incredibly expensive to buy. Um, this one is free. Um, it obviously has its limitations, but I would um, urge you to have a look at it and, and see what you think, because what it does is it allows you to catalog um, uh, records online and then to very quickly organize them into exhibitions. Um, there's an example of an Omega, Omega website, Omega, sorry, website here, um, which is called Many Days, Many Lives. Um, and this is um, a collaboration between George Mason University and the Gulag Archive in Moscow. Uh, so what we have here is um, the accounts of different people who were kept in the Russian Gulags. Um, there are quotations up here. Um, then there are sound and movie files which can be played. Um, I'm not going to play one of these just for risk of the internet breaking if I try and send too much data up the line. Um, but I will put all the links to all of these um, exhibitions um, out to you all. I'm just going to jump us back to um, my PowerPoint here. Um, and the next question I've just got in here is, um, how do you know who's visited the exhibition? Um, so very briefly, um, there are three main ways of, of finding out who's visited. Um, there's uh, tracking website traffic. Um, so Google Analytics is the biggest um, uh, provider of this. And um, WordPress has various tools that allow you to track uh, visitors and then to receive data about who they were, um, when they visited, what they did when they were there. Um, and sometimes you can even get profiles um, based on IP addresses of who those people are, um, uh, such as such as age, age data, age brackets and so on. The second one I want to mention is social media profiles. If you have um, uh, an Instagram or a Facebook page and you use that to promote your exhibition, you can then use the data that is collected by that page um, to monitor the, the, who it is that's, that's visiting. You can see who's clicked through uh, from your social media page to your exhibition. Um, and you can also use your, your, your uh, social media page to invite um, feedback, direct feedback from people. Um, it's quite a good way of communicating with your audience, um, but also the metrics that they provide uh, can be very useful to see the time of day that people visit, the type of people that visit, um, and uh, what they do when they, when they go to your exhibition. And thirdly, um, direct surveys, which you'll be more familiar with. Um, you can invite people to complete a short survey. Now, this is an uphill thing. It's pretty difficult to get people to fill in a survey because most of us just go, no, thank you, when this thing pops up. Uh, so you usually have to make a bit of a case for it. Um, National Museums of Scotland recently did a, a survey of teachers um, and they managed to get 330 responses um, to their survey about um, 
uh, online education and they did it by offering a prize draw so you don't discount bribery um, and corruption in um, in trying to get your feedback um, but if you can just make a straight case for it as well uh, just say look you know your your data is really useful to us and thank you very much for doing it and we love you and so on um, SurveyMonkey is probably the most well known of the free surveys um, platforms. Um, I suggest if you're doing a platform, uh, if you're doing a, a survey, no more than five questions. Okay, lastly, and I'm conscious that I've more than 20 minutes, um, I want to show you three other um, examples. So I have to, because I can only do one thing at once. I'm just going to go back to my Safari. And uh, where is it? Can you see that? Oh, yes, you can. Yes, sorry. Um, move that out of the way. Uh, so I want to show you this one first. This is called Painting by Numbers. Um, and it's the archive collection of the painter called Ferdinand Bauer. No, I haven't heard of him. I hadn't heard of him either. Uh, in the Library of New South Wales. And what they did was they took their, archived, uh, their archive of um, his uh, sketches, his original sketches, and then they sat them alongside the paintings um, that came from the sketches. So you can see that you can slide backwards and forwards. It's not actually very smooth here, so that's why you're getting that funny blue um, thing. And then if I just turn that off, you can see there's a whole lot of these um, original sketches. So if we go to this um, parrot here, you see it just opens up, and then we just click, and you can slide backwards and forwards between the original sketch and the final painting. Um, just a fun way to explore um, archive records. Uh, the second one I want to show you is called Fragments of Notes. Uh, Fragments of Note, sorry. Um, this is Magdalen College in Oxford, uh, and it explores uh, medieval um, music manuscripts. Now, this is an example of a Squarespace site. I'm pretty sure it's Squarespace anyway. Um, and it's just a straight vertical scrolling. So you can see that it just goes through a number of panels um, with information and images next to each other. It's nice and simple to um, to navigate just up and down. And then if you want to look at another one of their exhibitions, you can just go up to this um, menu in the corner and you go to another one. So there's actually a lot of information in this um, in this exhibition. And then you can go to the next section down the bottom here and just jump it and it should go, there we go. So it just jumps to the next one. And so your storyline is down the bottom here. And then your each um, element of the exhibition is a scrolling um, pathway. Lots and lots of information. If we go to the next section, music and books, just loads up. And then when I start to scroll, you can see the navigation appears at the bottom here. Um, and then the last one I want to show you um, is Abate University. And Abate University has produced this rather intriguing um, exhibition. Remember how I said that you could just set up an exhibition and then photograph it? Uh, well, here it is. But then you introduce um, VR or augmented reality. So you can click on any one of these buttons and it shows you in a bit more detail what it is that you're looking at. And this is the layering that I was talking about. So we go from our overview, if I come out of here, we go from our overview where we scroll around to first level where we get a bit of a description, but also the option to view the item. So we can go into a bit more detail. Um, a new window opens and with painful slow slowness, um, the item opens up and we see the actual record. And the original exhibition has remained open over here. Uh, we can even listen to it. I'm not going to play it to you, but um, it, we can listen to it being read to us. If you have VR goggles, you can actually you can actually view this in 3D and sort of look around like this. Um, quite extraordinary. Okay, just going to jump back here. 
Um, so that's the, the the examples I've just shown you. And uh, that is it from what I'm going to say. Um, but what I'm going to suggest that we do now is have a little chat um, about uh, aspects of online exhibitions. Um, I've put some questions up there, but really um, the floor is yours. Um, feel free to um, open up and um, just discuss any aspect of the subject that you would find useful. Um, I think one of the, the real values of a session like this is that we can we can um, share information with each other and and see what support is available, um, uh, you know, within the community um, for uh, supporting each other creating online exhibitions. I'll leave these questions up there for a bit and then I'll switch back so that I'm, I've uh, got you all on screen. So what I'd maybe start with is just asking um, what's what's anyone's um, experience of creating online exhibitions? Rory, you can't go first. Oh, hi Douglas. Thanks for that. That was really interesting. Um, made far too many notes as usual. Um, no, no experience at all. So where would be a good place to start in your view? Um, I think a good place to start is by trawling around the internet, having a look at examples of online exhibitions um, and look for two things. Um, one is um, what do you find interesting and inspiring? And two, what looks doable for you? So you, you, you go to one of those ones that's got all the bells and whistles and so on and you think, no, I can't possibly do that. So just look around a bit more and then you find maybe the Magdalen College one and you think, well, actually that's buildable. Um, even in WordPress, that's that's fairly buildable. Um, also collaborate with other people. Um, it, this is, it's tough to do this on your own. Um, it's much better to, um, to, to try and get some collaborators um, to work with you. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Um, which platform do you think is the easiest? I've got to do um, teach students to do an online exhibition using the archive collections, and I don't know how technical their knowledge they will have. So I just wondered which one you think would be the easiest for me to teach them to do something. Um, what age are the students? Um, well, the university students. So probably early 20s they're probably much better than me but i don't know yeah i, I mean I, I i think i think you answer your own question there you, if if you're dealing with um people really under under 30 um then there the, there is a there is a certain um net savvy um sort of capability there anyway i, I would i think um wordpress is probably the most well known of the platforms um it's free um, and it, it, there are lots and lots of sites that use WordPress and there's lots of help available. Uh, one great resource actually is YouTube. Um, it is just extraordinary um, the amount of time that people spend putting up really good quality tutorials on just about anything on earth um, on YouTube. And so if you want to know how to create an online exhibition using WordPress, you just have to put that into Google and, and they go to videos and you will find stuff that shows you how to do a very basic setup of, of WordPress and then a bit more detail, uh, even down to granular level, how to use particular tools, how to click through menus and so on. So I would, yeah, WordPress is probably one I would, um, I would say. Um, have you used Wix? No, I mean, I've used WordPress quite a lot, but I've not used Wix, so I'm, I've written it down to have a look. 
Um, the advantage of Wix is, and, and Squarespace is the same, is, is that it's uh, it's a graphic interface. So there's no coding involved. There's no sort of clicking your way through hundreds of menus to make sure that you've got all the settings just right. It's a, it's a kind of, I want a box here. I want a heading there. I want a line that goes down here. I want um, some text that sits in here and I want my picture there. And it will basically do all of that. And it does all the coding in the background. Um, so these these graphical these graphic interfaces are actually really useful for um, for those of us who don't want to devote our lives to learning how to to do advanced coding, um, but we just want we know what we want and 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 we want to be able to use it a bit like um, a desktop publishing um, tool. Thank you. That's really really helpful. I, you're right about YouTube. I've been teaching myself to sew, and without um, YouTube, I wouldn't know how to real bobbins or loads of things so yeah definitely really helpful so thank you yeah mm. um, if i could could i ask rudy a couple of quick questions are you there rudy yes uh -huh. i'm here uh, how, how are you <laughs> hi barry yeah uh, doing very well how about you I'm not bad. I'm just enjoying your little uh, manufacturing miniature uh, thing. I was looking at it earlier. Uh, I mean, I have many questions, but I mean, first of all, <laughs> who, how did you set this up, and 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 are you now completely conversant with the software? Can you do this all on your own now? Um, I, right. My big confession is that, um, as Douglas said, uh, uh, we uh, and that is. Uh, my colleague Hope and I uh, have a very, very good web team um, who were very, very helpful to us because we were in the position um, uh, of actually being able to set up that exhibition physically uh, way back uh, just in March. Uh, and uh, uh, all of a sudden, uh, we couldn't do it anymore. Uh, and so we went back and we had to think about it and we spoke to our web team just about what was possible. Uh, and what we decided was that we wanted to um, basically to provide uh, the experience of the physical exhibition, but with a few extra things that technology could provide us with. And the web team very quickly said that they had a 360 degree camera um, that we could use in order to be able to do that. Um, uh, and so uh, in the summer, um, we had uh, a fantastic time for two hours, um, basically setting up the, the shortest exhibition in Christendom. Um, <laughs> and, um, and basically, um, uh, and uh, uh, Peter from the web team basically just coming in uh, and setting up the 360 degree camera. Uh, and we had it. Basically, we had the image um, probably within about half an hour because we had to do a few tweaks in order to be able to fit everything in. Um, and then after that, you know, the hard work was actually then getting all the images um, matched up with, uh, you know, with the, uh, uh, you know, with the actual items um, and getting all the captions and things done. So, uh, I mean, by no means was it simple, but certainly the actual uh, you know, the setup was, um, like I say, it was very, very quick and very simple to do. But after that, you know, the real hard work was actually just getting all of the, getting all of the images and captions sorted out. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things uh, that's not clear from that image um, uh, is actually just the pathway. Um, uh, you know, the images, sorry, the, the items. Uh, and this is this is my oversight, and it is going to get fixed. But um, uh, the items uh, are laid out, and the pathway through them isn't actually clear. But they are actually organised into particular sections, you know, beginnings and endings, uh, war, interwar, and postwar. Um, but uh, that's not clear. But um, I think what we're going to do is we're going to um, uh, what we're going to do is we're, we're going to put some opaque lettering just to sort of make that pathway a bit clearer. Um, uh, and the narrative, uh, I think we already had it in the banners. That's why we've we've got the banners. They were there for the physical exhibition and they were going to be there just to be able to provide that narrative. But um, uh, yeah, I, I think it's, um, 
I, I suppose it's just that it's uh, it was all kind of born out of necessity. Sorry, I've strayed way off the point. No, not but, at all. Um, that is, uh, that, that's that's answered all my questions because that, that was my <laughs> that was my big one about yours was um, how how did you control that narrative? But now I see that you um, you can see from the actual picture. Of course, there's a beginnings and there is an endings. But, um, so that that's that's answered that. So just my, sorry, my last question for you, Ruth, I'm putting you on the spot here. What sort of mm -hmm. feedback have you had from this? Because it's looking. I mean, for a first go, this is hugely impressive. Um, the feedback has been uh, really positive. Um, I, I, I think it's, um, yeah. I, I, I don't think we've, I, I don't think we've really had um, any negative feedback. You know, it's all been very positive. It's all been enthusiastic. I've had people from, uh, uh, I've had uh, someone from Carmarthenshire. Um, uh, you know. Uh, you know, congratulating us on the uh, uh, yeah on, on the exhibition. Uh, someone from the uh, uh, Institute of Conservators, um, as well as you know, more locally, um, you know, we got an honourable mention at University Court. Um, you know, without any prompting from my line manager either. So you know, it's sort of, um, it's, uh, it's it's been well noticed. Um, uh, so, I think um, yeah. I think I think one of the things that um, your your responses there shows up, Rory, is is that um, putting together an online exhibition um, it, it is at least as much work as putting together a physical exhibition. It's just different work, um, uh, but enlisting the help of others is, it, I think, was essential, wasn't it? Yeah, it was completely. Because um, apart from anything else, um, you know, we are kind of bound to use uh, our own institutional website um, and whilst we've got control of uh, you know some fairly simple stuff on the website when it came to something like that we we wouldn't have been able to do it um, uh, any other way you know without the help of the web team and without having uh, you know without having someone actually giving us a bit of guidance on um, certain things that we can and can't do so yeah. um, uh, thanks for that yeah, and the technical expertise was essential, really. Yeah. Any other thoughts from folks about? Um, yeah. Hi, Jenny. Um, I've just got a quite a specific question, if that's okay. And um, I do feel a bit bad asking it, given all the wonderful tools that you've just shown us. Um, but the particular project that I'm working on just now, I'm a bit time short. Um, I have a WordPress site for the project. Um, I have a PowerPoint presentation which I've done, which has got a number of slides with a sort of narrative in it. And I just wondered if there was some way that I could use that for an online exhibition in, in my WordPress site. Is that a possibility at all? Yes, you can. Um, you can export um, a, a PowerPoint presentation as a series of images or of PDFs. Um, so, so that each of the slides is exported separately as a, a, probably an image. Um, I wouldn't. I'm, I don't think I could name the particular keystrokes you'd need to use, but um, you you need to export it as images. You then get a folder um, with with every slide from the PowerPoint separately as a, a as a JPEG image, and you can use those then as images directly into an online exhibition in WordPress. Okay. That's great. Okay. You can you can also then if you if you export it also as a PDF, um, you can then offer that as a download. If people come and view the exhibition and then they want uh, copies of the stuff, you can then say, well, look, you click click here and you can download the entire thing as a PDF. So that might be something you could you you might want to offer as well. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, I think there's a question in the chat as well. Actually. Um, yes, uh, there was a question in the chat about um, using Adobe Spark, and I've um, I've answered it um, directly rather than sending it to everybody. Um, um, Helen was asking about using Adobe Spark, which is a uh, um, one of the many tools that's offered by uh, Adobe. Um, it's primarily used for. Um, Creating uh, sort sort of um, sort of banners and logos, and, and you can make posters and things with it. Um, but they also you can create web pages with it. Um, it's worth a look actually, and I think you're allowed to use it free. 
Um, I, I use it because I've got the Creative Cloud, but I'm pretty sure it's one of the free tools. So it's called Adobe Spark. Um, and it's it's quite it's it's actually really good for creating um, nice lettering and banners and things. If you want to, you can then just export those as images and use them in um, in a, in an exhibition. Um, great for the um, for, for the text part of your your exhibition and for for labels and so on. Um, a couple of other messages in there. Um, Microsoft Sway, uh, which I haven't heard of actually. Um, and the Google Arts and Culture site. Yes, Arts and Co Google Arts and Culture is really interesting um, site for having a look at online collections. Um, and I think that there is a facility for creating simple exhibitions there as well. Um, I have been wondering, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi. <laughs> yes, uh, I have been uh, wondering about Sway as well. I, I think it actually looks similar to what you showed us from Maudlin College, the Squarespace. So it's like a, our chief ex executive uses it for his newsletters and it just, just flows um, along uh, across the screen, which is quite nice. Um. Um, I can share a little bit about what we've done. I mean, I've made a, a practice Sway presentation. I haven't actually shared it with anyone. Um, I kind of forgot about it until uh, I was listening to this and remembered, oh, actually I did do an experimental presentation. It's really good if you have a lot of visual things, it'll automatically um, format your visuals into a nice um, pretty kind of timeline or I don't know, slides. And then you can add um, appropriate text captions with it okay. as well. Um, I could show an example if you want to see. Um, yeah. Uh, sure. Um, if Robert is able to give you a uh, screen sharing. Um, uh, let's see. Right. Doesn't. Are you oh, able no. to share your screen? It doesn't look like it at the moment, no. Um, if you um, if you put the link in the chat, then I can I can uh, look it up and uh, and share it. Um, oh, the issue is it's um, uh, password protected for internal sign on only at the moment. So. Okay. Sorry, Douglas. Um, as you're the host, you actually have the power to do it rather than me as oh, host today. Power. Yes, you oh, have the power. <laughs> how do I? All right. How do I do that? Um, advanced sharing options uh, so if you go into the participants uh, box and find samantha uh, and then you should have a more box and then uh, make co-host okay <laughs> done right. so you Ooh. should be able to share that now samantha yes can you see let's see can you see now? Yes. Perfect. Oh. Right. So this is um, the experiment I've done because Doers has tons of advertising. Um, so it was kind of an intuitive collection to go to for trying to make an exhibition. And this is our home, what the home page would look like. And then you can either click this button here for a timeline, because I've chosen to set it up as a timeline. Um, or you can click the arrows here, which takes you through an exhibition. Um, so that's really cool. I like that. Order. Yeah, there's, I, I would say it's limited customization options from what I remember. Um, like you can add in lots of photos, but they don't necessarily, um, let you choose exactly how you want everything formatted. But once you figure it out, um, it can make it look quite slick, I would say, without you having to know a lot of technical things, which is a benefit. Mm. Um, so that's kind of how we've done it. Um, but like I said, I have and, actually, you can click through and look at, um, let's see, I have some galleries in here that have like this one, for example. So, um, you oh, nice. into, yeah. into the specific ones, if you want to close up, et cetera. That's really effective. Mm. Yeah, it's quite so, good. Um, it's really Samantha, one, it's really great, Samantha. Yeah, once you, um, once you've created that, how, mm -hmm. how do you get that online? Because that's, I mean, that's just running on your computer, isn't it? No, this in is, um, this is on 
this is on the internet. <laughs> this is on All right, so this is this is on the Sway site, is it? Yeah. So Sway is um, part of Office 365, I think. So if I go into our um, our Bacardi Office 365 uh, website and look at the apps that are available, Sway was just one of the options. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know a lot more details than that because, as I said, I haven't like uh, investigated it too much. But, um, I can stop sharing now. But that might Thank be an you. option if you if that's um that, that's really it. useful. I've um I've made a note of that and I will um I will update my presentation and then present pr pretend that I invented it myself. <laughs> um anyone else got anything of that type that they've um had experience of using um uh, that 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 where you can create some kind of a presentation? It looks like I'm just looking this up. Actually, it does look, look like um, Sway is part of 365. So if you've got a either corporate or or personal membership of that, then you've got access to it. It looks like the um, the presentations are presented only on the Sway site. So so it, it's just given a code number on Sway um, uh, on the Microsoft site. Um, there may be there may be export. A capability in there too so that you could then export it as some kind of file and then have it on your own site um, or you can simply link it link it through and it was introduced in 2015 Okay, uh, well, we are um, uh, export capability, Samantha, yes, um, to PDF and Word. Okay, um, we're just about out of our out of our time. So that's our um, our ten, which was the video I put up uh, at the beginning of the week. Our twenty, which was my half an hour presentation, and uh, our thirty, which was our discussion. Um, thank you all for coming along and being part of it. Um, thanks for those really useful um, contributions uh, in, in the chat. Um, as I said, we are recording the, the session, so that will be made available to you. Um, and we are running this session again um, next Friday. Um, I'm not sure if there are any places available um, on that that one, um, but it is, yeah, it is happening again next Friday. And then about a week later, I'll be putting out the next one, um, the next of our 10, 20, 30s. So thanks very much, everyone, for taking part and uh, look forward to seeing you again next time.